You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 22, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, cutaneous mastocytosis. Our presenter is Dr. Ashley Matthews. She's a pediatric resident at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. MedPeds resident, I'm going to talk about cutaneous mastocytosis. So um, mastocytosis is a pathological increase of mast cells in cutaneous tissue, but it can also be in extracutaneous tissues as well, which really goes on to represent a different disease process called systemic mastocytosis. Um, there's really multiple different types of cutaneous mastocytosis. Urticaria pigmentosa is the most commonly diagnosed type. It also goes by another name called maculopapular cutaneous mastocytosis. And then within that diagnosis, there's multiple different types, typical plaque and nodular forms. Um, there's also been described telangiectasia, macularis, eruptiva, perstans, diffuse cutaneous mastocytosis, which tends to be a more severe form of the disease, and then solitary mastocytosis. Um, throughout the presentation, I've put some pictures in there just to um, allow us to look at some of the different kinds of presentations, but this is a pretty common picture of urticaria pigmentosa. So as far as the epidemiology goes, because it's just such a rare disease and not a lot of studies have been done on it, the incidence of it is really pretty much unknown. Um, some sources I didn't include in here that I looked at was that possibly less than 200,000 people in the United States affected. Um, 60 to 80 percent of cases are going to present in the first year of life. And there's been found to be no gender difference and no ethnic predominance. And this is a picture of maculonodular mastocytosis. So when it presents, um, it's usually going to be the urticaria pigmentosa form, which represents about 70 to 90 percent of cases. The lesions are usually going to be red, to yellow, to brown in color, usually pretty small, a few millimeters to one to two centimeters in diameter, usually located on the trunk and extremities, but it can be found on other parts of the body with other forms. Sometimes palms, soles, and scalp can be severely affected. Um, the derrier sign is helpful diagnostically, and that's when you scratch or provide some mechanical trauma to a lesion. You'll get the wheel and flare reaction. Um, if the patient's having a flare of this problem, a lot of times they'll have erythema, swelling, and blistering of these lesions. It can be very itchy, and oftentimes they have dermatographism. It's important to note that the number of skin lesions has not been associated with the severity of the disease process. So other symptoms that patients can present with can include hypertension, GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, chronic abdominal pain, also headache. Anaphylaxis is rare, but it has been reported. Um, with the cutaneous type, it's usually not going to involve angioedema. It's going to be mostly related to the hypotension and the GI effects. Um, it's important that patients learn to recognize those triggers that cause a flare and to try to avoid those things. Commonly, medications like opioids and NSAIDs can trigger a flare. Temperature extremes, either hot or cold. Surgical procedures, the actual instrumentation itself can be a problem, but then also the anesthetics that are administered, like muscle relaxants and opioids, can have direct and indirect effects on mast cells. And so it never, whenever you're thinking about um, one of your patients with cutaneous mastocytosis undergoing a surgical procedure, that does take some special planning to make sure it can be done safely. Um, also, spicy foods and alcohol, emotional stress, infections, hymenopterous things have been reported in the literature to cause anaphylaxis, and then toxic exposures such as um, jellyfish or snake venom has been reported to cause a flare. This is um, a more severe presentation of bolus mastocytosis. Um, the picture on the upper left is an uh, African-American child, and it's a Caucasian child on the bottom. And the two pictures on the bottom is a before and after treatment. So you can see that the skin cleared up quite a bit, responded nicely 
So for the disease course, uh, most of the lesions are going to present within the first year of life. In one study that was done, it showed that the mean age of development of lesions was about two and a half months of age. Um, most of those lesions are going to resolve by the age of 10 or before puberty. For those people who go on to develop lesions later in life, if the lesions weren't developing until after age 10, the mean onset of lesions was 26.5 years. Um, there's a number of risk factors that have been identified for systemic mastocytosis, and that includes the late development of lesions, so lesions that develop after age 2, lesions that persist beyond adolescence, if they have the diffuse cutaneous mastocytosis variant. And then if you suspect that there's already systemic involvement with organomegaly, um, enlargement of spleen and liver, and then lymphadenopathy. And then an abnormal CBC is also a sign of systemic illness. What and what did you see on the abnormal CBC? You can see lymphopenias, anemias, um, thrombocytopenia. Because the mast cells are taking up all this space in the bone marrow? That's my understanding, yeah. Is there an increased risk for malignancies, too, like leukemia? Yes. Yeah. So you'd want to make sure you weren't missing. Yeah, the, the, on the differential, they have reported, like, blast cells being present oh. or other things, yeah. yeah. Um, and then for adults who are diagnosed, 90% of them who have skin lesions will also have systemic disease at the time of their diagnosis, which is much different than how pediatric patients typically present. So this is um, plaque mastocytosis, just a couple of different ways that it can present. So the pathogenesis of the disease is really not well understood, but it's been suggested that maybe it's related to a mutation in C-KIT. And C-KIT is the gene that codes for KIT, which is a membrane receptor protein for a stem cell factor that's expressed on the surface of mast cells. And in adults who have systemic mastocytosis, a KIT mutation is almost always found. For histopathology, we know that there's an increased number of mast cells in the papillary dermis, and depending on the type of cutaneous mastocytosis, it might even invade more layers of the skin. Um, there's really no standardized numbers, but usually it's going to be a really significant increase, as much as tenfold more than normal. And then for diagnosis, um, it can be helpful to look for the barrier sign, um, because that's oftentimes associated, but not always. A tryptase level is also something we should look at. Um, the literature that I looked at said that, you know, typically if it's above 11 to 15, that's usually a sign of pretty severe de disease and possibly systemic disease. A skin biopsy is really a very helpful way. That's what, how you're going to find out if you have increased mast cell infiltration. And then you should also consider doing the C-kit analysis for that mutation. And then if you're suspecting systemic disease, checking a CBC, LFT, and tryptase level can be helpful for that. And then you may want to consider doing an abdominal ultrasound. And then ultimately, a bone marrow biopsy would be needed in order to confirm that diagnosis. And it is important to note here that the tryptase level has been shown to correlate with severity of disease. So in managing the condition, first and foremost, patients have to learn how to avoid their triggers. Um, topical therapies include chromolin sodium, which is going to help stabilize the mast cell, keep them from degranulating, and the topical steroids. Systemic therapy might be for more mild to moderate cases, so H1 and H2 receptor antagonists to block the histamine receptor, oral chromolin sodium, um, sodium. And then the PUVA radiation has also been found to be helpful. It's most effective in non-hyperpigmented diffuse cutaneous mastocytosis, um, but there are some adverse effects that might uh, want to be considered. It can cause photofibrosis, malignant melanoma, and then direct ocular damage. And then as far as pediatrics goes, cytoreductive therapy is almost never needed because the course tends to be pretty benign, tends to resolve by adolescence. However, if you're dealing with an adult or you're thinking that you have more of a systemic process that's maybe hedging more towards a mast cell malignancy, cytoreductive therapy might be considered at that time, and you would definitely need a bone marrow biopsy in that instance. Can they talk about the chromolin in terms of like how often you use it? Because if you think it's a mast cell stabilizer, you'd want to use it before you 
urticate those lesions or whatever whereas topical steroids I could do using like at the time. Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of like regimen? It's like you have them do it every couple times a week or um, you know I. That? I do think that one of the articles I reviewed, it had some schedules in there, but I don't recall what it said. And then these were the three um, sources that I primarily used for the data that's in the talk. Um, and as you can see, it pretty much all comes from the same people. And so it's a very small number of people who are doing the research on it. Did you read anything about someone who has just cutaneous mastitis, do you? I know if you have a suspicion for systemic, like lymphadenopathy or thalassonomegaly, you'd get screening tests. But do you get screening tests like every so often? Did it talk about how often you do that, like yearly? Yeah, it recommends um, follow-up about every 6 to 12 months, at least in the clinic. And then I believe what I was seeing was mostly just yearly lab work, like LFT, CBC, tryptase level. Mm -hmm. The biggest controversial point that I can recall in, in recent time in our institution was whether to biopsy an infant who had really severe disease, mm -hmm. a, a bone marrow biopsy an infant who had very severe disease or not, and it was very, it caused a lot of angst because there was definitely a, a group of, no, let it run its course, odds are it's still going to run out, and there was a group that said, no, this is way too severe, we need to know if he's... You mean like severe, like cutaneous, like has pretty severe... Severe cutaneous, but he was yeah. so young yeah. that, um, you know, the bone marrow was... What did they end up doing? I actually don't know. I don't oh. think he got bone marrow, though. You know, were you were you the attending following him? No, I don't recall who who was following. Him. We had one, yeah. and I think actually seen a couple this month or something. But I have one that I have one that I follow, and the second one that we had the other day that has like all over his trunk and back. He's like twelve or thirteen now, so you would expect me to develop them within the first year. And mm -hmm. so at the point where we expect them to have gone away, they faded, but they're still diffused on his. Back. And so we're kind of starting to work out. Yeah, so we're starting everything. We're starting like, and there's questionable history of the systemic stuff that oh. is just not validated whether or not it's yep. true. Is this tryptase level back? I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. It's usually mm -hmm. a send out, and it takes several days, almost even a week. Interesting. So. Yeah. And that Marianne Castell, who wrote the articles, all three of the articles we put, is the one that we email when oh, we see someone. Absolutely. She's yeah. definitely the most yeah. knowledgeable. Yeah. Also. Yeah, there you go. Those are the guys. Those are Jamaican the in Michigan. mystery patients and most troublesome ones. And, and a lot of them go through, like our patients, they like go through dermatology for a little while, cause especially initially they get some germs, don't know what it is, and get it biopsied. And, mm -hmm. so, I mean, our kids have never been biopsied by an allergist, and it's been on for like 12, 13 years. So. Yeah, yeah. It seems to me that a triptase would be a less invasive way of making the diagnosis. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my impression is that the diagnosis is being made more frequently now that we have a, a simpler way of making the diagnosis. It's being done more frequently. So it's very interesting. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Matthew. Thank Thank you so much. Great. Yeah. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. See you next time.